Hi, good morning everyone. Today we are going to talk about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and conduct disorder. Um, I think I should probably explain why I am talking about this um, and a little bit about my background. I'm an adolescent forensic psychiatrist. I've been working at Alberta Hospital Edmonton um, within the forensic services that deals just with youth uh, for about four years. And um, I am trained as a forensic psychiatrist as well as child and adolescent psychiatrist. And in my practice, um, a number of youth uh, that we see on the unit do present with symptoms that are suggestive of uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Uh, so this, this presentation is not necessarily about uh, FASD itself, but it's about looking at uh, the relationship between FASD and conduct disorder and what are some of the assessment issues that we need to be aware of. So the session goals for this presentation would be a brief look at the diagnosis, the role of family assessment uh, in the greater assessment bit itself, uh, environmental factors associated with outcome, assessment issues specific to FASD associated with conduct disorder, risk assessment, and also assessment of comorbidity associated with FASD and conduct disorder. Now, if we look at diagnosis of FASD in Canada, uh, the Canadian Diagnostic Guidelines do uh, base the diagnosis on the Institute of Medicine Terminology and the four-digit diagnostic code uh, along with significant deficits in at least three areas of brain functioning. Now, as far as fetal alcohol syndrome diagnosis is concerned, uh, it's, it's actually considered to be a group of disorders which is characterized by physical, mental, behavioral, and learning difficulties. And what is important to understand is that a youth or an adult may not present with all these symptoms which might lead to a diagnosis. And we'll talk more about it as we go through the rest of the slides. So somebody might present with just physical or mental or behavioral attributes and may not present with a lower IQ. While there might be others who present with mental and behavioral difficulties, but may not present with the physical attributes. And we'll talk more about what the physical attributes are associated with FASD. Obviously, there has to be a history of prenatal alcohol exposure. And again, uh, the presence or absence of a confirmed prenatal alcohol exposure leads to uh, slight differences in the way that we diagnose FASD. Uh, so it might often be associated with, but not always, growth retardation, a cluster of facial abnormalities, and a variety of neurological, cognitive, and behavioral disorders. So when we talk about the diagnostic categories under FASD, there are four categories, alcohol-related birth defects, alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorders, partial fetal alcohol syndrome, and fetal alcohol syndrome. Now, again, all these categories are based on the manifestation of the difficulties associated with prenatal exposure to alcohol. And as, as I was mentioning earlier, not all people who are diagnosed with possible fetal alcohol-related uh, difficulties may present with all these features. So if we look at alcohol-related birth defects, they might present with a number of congenital abnormalities, which could include malformations and dysplasias of various organs and systems in our body. So one of the things we might see if we look at the cardiac system is uh, at atrial septal defects or ventricular septal defects. So basically, there might be difficulties with circulation of blood in the body. Similarly, we might see difficulties 
with the skeletal system. So an example of that might be a shortened fifth digit. There might be hyperplastic nails. We might see abnormalities within the renal system. So somebody might present with aplastic, hyperplastic, or dysplastic kidneys. And virtually all deficits have been identified within the ocular system. So it could lead to visual problems. It could lead to um, difficulties adjusting your vision, maybe night blindness, everything. So now if we look at the alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder, these people generally present with symptoms of central nervous system damage but without facial anomalies. So there may, might be decreased cranial size at birth, so they, they may have a smaller brain. And that, that might be associated with structural brain abnormalities. That is, again, it could be microcephaly, that is a smaller brain size. It could be agenesis of corpus callosum. They may also have hard or soft neurological signs. Uh, so they might have impaired fine motor skills. Uh, one of uh, the presentations that we might see with impaired fine motor skills is that they have difficulty tying their shoelaces. Or sometimes these kids might present with difficulty buttoning their jeans, which is a kind of complicated activity for some of these people. They might also have poor eye-hand coordination. Then associated with these central nervous system damage, they might also present with other behavioral or cognitive abnormalities, which are actually not consistent with the developmental level of the youth. And that cannot be explained on familial background or by genetic abnormalities. The next diagnostic category that is used is partial fetal alcohol syndrome. So the difference, major difference here from a full diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome is that there is no confirmation of maternal alcohol exposure. But these people, these youth might present with two or more of the facial anomalies, may have one or more of the other characteristics associated with behavioral or cognitive deficits, which are again inconsistent with the developmental level and are not based on any genetic deficiencies. So, so the big difference uh, with a full diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome from partial fetal alcohol syndrome is that there is a confirmed maternal exposure to alcohol. And sometimes we find when we are doing an assessment uh, on youth specifically who have been in care for a while, who might have been adopted, who are in foster care, where the records from child welfare services may not be available in relation to the biological mother, it is difficult to determine whether there has been prenatal exposure to alcohol or not. So we, we usually, in those cases, end up making a diagnosis of partial fetal alcohol syndrome, despite the fact that all the other features might be present. Uh, the, the features that we do look for in the youth is, again, prenatal or postnatal growth retardation, which could be determined from hospital records, birth records, and also both the height as well as the weight of the individual being less than the 10th percentile. Again, there are facial anomalies and uh, central nervous system damage, which results in structural or functional impairment. As far as the facial anomalies is concerned, uh, there could be a number of features that, that are seen. So there might be a short pal palpebral fissure. Uh, the youth might present with a flat mid face, a short nose, an indistinct philtrum, which is the space between the nose and the upper lip, a thin upper lip, they might have minor ear abnormalities. The nasal bridge might be lower, and they might have epicanthal folds. Again, not all the youth who have been affected will present with all these features. They may have some or all of the features. Uh, 
as far as the neurological impairments are concerned that are associated with FASD, they might present with learning disability, social inept ineptness, poor judgment, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. And when we start looking at some of these features, they could be associated with uh, other mental health problems as well. As, as one can see, some of these might very well be seen in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, so that's where it's important to look at other features as well when we are trying to make a diagnosis of FASD. As far as the four digits code system is concerned, uh, it is based on the magnitude of the expression of severity of the four key diagnostic features that are associated with fetal alcohol syndrome. So those four features are growth deficiency, the facial phenotype, CNS damage or dysfunction, and gestational exposure to alcohol. The severity of each of these features is ranked independently on a four-point scale where one reflects a complete absence of one of these features, while four reflects its extreme expression. So if we are not sure, for example, of gestational exposure to alcohol, the, the person will score one on that category, while if we are sure, then the score on that category would be four. So moving on to primary disabilities associated with FASD, uh, there is a potential of loss of intellectual abilities. They could have severe visual problems. The youth might present with dyslexia, learning disabilities, behavioral problems, as well as low level of adaptive functioning. And some of these difficulties may be a result of moving from one place to another with the expectation to adapt to the changes. Now, even as a youth who may not have any of the intellectual disabilities or any other associated problems, if they move from one place to another frequently, it is difficult for them to adapt. Um, I probably take my own example where I've, uh, in the last 15 years, probably moved through three different continents, uh, don't even know how many cities. And uh, my, my kid actually is quite unhappy because of lack of friends due to frequent movements and has threatened to abandon me if I move again. So, <laughs> which, which kind of explains the difficulty that even we, who might be considered as normal human beings, have to adapt to these changes. Then there are associated difficulties. So uh, dyslexia itself could present with ongoing difficulties in school, which may be seen as defiance or conduct problems. Now, moving on to secondary difficulties, which might present as a result of these primary disabilities. So there is a likelihood of increased mental health issues. They could present with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, hyperactivity in itself, extreme impulsiveness. They may have difficulty making or understanding issues around moral judgment. So they may not have the capacity to form relationships or have empathy. They, they are likely to have more involvement in antisocial behaviors. So they are likely to present as having sociopathic behaviors. They are more likely to be unemployed because of their difficulties in forming relationships, because of their difficulties with hyperactivity, because of possible difficulties with substance misuse. They are more likely to be in trouble with the law. They have difficulty understanding the consequences of their actions. They have difficulty understanding the consequences of their actions, not only on the victims, but for themselves as well. They probably also have difficulty, actually, in taking time to sit down and think about their actions before going out and practically doing them. 
So they, they are more likely to be in trouble with the law. They are more likely to be in prisons. And on similar account, they are also likely to have inappropriate sexual behaviors, usually very frequent changes of sexual partners, more likely to have unprotected sex, and also more likely to have sexually transmitted diseases. They are also more likely to be victims of offenses. They have difficulty explaining themselves as a result of all these issues. So they may not be able to express themselves properly, which is further complicated by the fact that they may also have difficulty understanding social cues. So what we might call as nonverbal language or body language, which might result in indiscriminate social behaviors or difficulties communicating in social situations. They might have memory and executive function difficulties, which again might lead to difficulties in planning. Uh, an example of that for me was with one of my patients who was actually involved in a robbery. And this 17-year-old youth who has a diagnosis of FASD was involved in a robbery, goes out, robs the shop. No problems, the shopkeeper gives him the money. The youth walks away, but then for no apparent reason decides to walk back and stab this shopkeeper. So when he was interviewed later, he had no explanation or no reason to stab the shopkeeper. He just think, didn't think about it and did it. Now, what we might also see is some different age-related issues that might be evident in people who have been diagnosed with FASD. So a newborn is more likely to present with sleeping and feeding difficulties is more likely to be weak, sick, irritable, and tremulous because he or she might be withdrawing from alcohol. They may have difficulty sleeping, which might result in excessive crying. They are likely to be hypersensitive to light and sound, and sometimes might present with seizures or failure to thrive. While as they grow up in early childhood or in preschool ages, they might present as being talkative and friendly, which is because of lack of social boundaries. They might have temper tantrums. Again, they might be hyperactive uh, and be small for age. So they, they're, if their growth is charted on the growth chart, they, they usually are probably around 10th percentile or lower than that. They also usually present with speech delays and fine motor abnormalities as well as mental retardation. As they grow older with middle childhood, they still continue to be small for age, still present with some impulsivity, impaired attention, poor social skills, specific learning difficulties, ongoing language deficiencies, lack of organization. So these are the kids who would usually be sent home for not doing their homework on a regular basis are not being able to find their classrooms as they move to junior high or high school where they may not have a fixed room. And they don't even only have to organize their timetable but have also got to organize themselves in a manner so that they can move from one classroom to another and be there on time with the right books. They might also present with impaired abstract thinking as well as mental retardation. So how that might affect is they have difficulty forming hypotheses. So if Say, for example, if I'm thinking I want to go and rob somebody, I do not necessarily have the ability to understand the consequences as well as look at the action before I do it. I just perform that action as I'm there without thinking about the consequences, without actually thinking about the steps to get there. As they grow older, with adolescence and adulthood, the, the 
facial anomalies might actually disappear, so they, they might become indistinguishable. Their poor school performance is likely to continue, and they will still continue to have impaired judgment, behavioral problems, and poor peer relationships, all of which lead to an increased likelihood of continuing involvement with the criminal justice system. They're also likely to engage in substance misuse, which in our experience has commonly been associated with the transition to junior high school. So around 13, 14 years of age, when they are going into a school where they may come across with a new peer group, have difficulties forming relationship, and it's easier to get accepted by an antisocial peer group because they're isolated. One of the ways to get acceptance and be part of a group is start using substances. They're also likely to present with depression, a high rate of teenage pregnancies, as well as difficulties in having living skills. Obviously, mental retardation just carries on. The other compounding factors which result in an increase in some of these difficulties are dysfunctional family backgrounds. Most of these youth come from families where, where most likely the carers or the parents are absent, or if they are present, they have significant histories of alcohol and substance misuse themselves. They have been involved with the criminal justice system, so they are not present to provide supervision or care. The parents or the carers might themselves have mental health problems. They might also be involved in physically, sexually, or emotionally abusing these youth, which further then leads to school and occupational difficulties. And it also depends on the cultural background. And I, I'm probably going to leave the cultural background as it is right now, because I'll be discussing more about it uh, in my later slides. Now, the other associated features that we might see with FASD is the actual prevalence. And that's where I said I'll, I'll talk more about the cultural factors. Uh, there have been studies, obviously, to indicate that there is a relatively high percentage of ab original population with a diagnosis of FASD. However, it's, it's controversial in that there is also association with other factors, such as age of the mother at the time of birth, the socioeconomic status of the family. So mothers who are from low socioeconomic status, who are older, who have lower education levels, are more likely to have alcohol and substance misuse related issues, resulting in kids with FASD. These mothers are also likely to be unemployed, and they are also likely to have more issues related to abuse and neglect for themselves while they were growing up. And all these factors might result for these mums to have reduced access to prenatal and postnatal care, as well as services associated around uh, pregnancy. They are also more likely to have inadequate nutrition and poor developmental environment while they were pregnant. There have also been concerns that some cultures are some groups of people believe that small amounts of alcohol during pregnancy are not harmful or even good during pregnancy. So th those, those kind of can be considered as cultural factors, but they're more associated with other factors. So it's difficult to say that it is necessarily a cultural issue. And, and in some ways, when we talk about treatment of FASD, I think the biggest factor is always prevention. 
And that's where we need to focus on the health of the mother and the education of the mother, who is more likely to have been subjected to abuse during her childhood, who is more likely to come from low socioeconomic status, as I mentioned, is more likely to have mental health issues, addictions issues, may have been isolated, and may have lack of supportive health and social care. They are generally bounced from one service to another. Pro housing won't probably accept them because they would want the addictions and the house, uh, mental health issues to be sorted out before they are accepted for housing. Addiction services won't accept them because they want the mental health issues to be sorted out before they can accept them. And mental health services won't accept them because they want the addiction issues to be sorted out. So basically, they are just bounced from one service to another. which obviously consequently then affects the environmental factors of the youth as they're growing up, resulting in disruption of school experience. They have frequent suspensions. They are expelled from schools. They drop out. They use alcohol and drugs because they have role models who have been using alcohol and drugs. They have attention difficulties. They have repeatedly incomplete schoolwork. They have difficulty getting along with peers and are disruptive in class. And if we look at cluster of all these symptoms and then marry them with poor social choices, a desire to be accepted, low self-esteem, limited coping abilities, and poor peer relations, what we have got is a youth who is likely to be easily led by delinquent peers. I'll, I'll probably talk about another of uh, youth that we have been dealing with. Uh, he's 16 or 17 years old. Uh, I think he's almost 17. We have known him for two years now. He's already had five admissions with us in the last two years. His IQ is, I think, 58. Uh, very low functioning, hasn't been to a regular school for about six years now, uh, very dysfunctional family, has a mother who has been absent for a number of years, he's been a permanent uh, ward of the child welfare services since a very early age, has two siblings, one is a 20 year old sister and the other is a 13 year old sister. Mother comes in and goes frequently without any consistency. This kid has been living on the streets, has absolutely no idea what goes on in his world in some ways. Goes out whenever he's out in the community, gets drunk, uses drugs, because that's all he knows. He doesn't have any other abilities to associate with his peers. Unfortunately, then, these are also the peers who are involved with the criminal justice system. This youth was on one occasion associated with two other youths who were higher functioning than him, decided to run away from the group home. He accompanied these two kids and they assaulted another youth. Now, for our youth who has FASD, uh, for our young guy, it started as a game where the victim of this offense initially was playing with these three kids. But then these two other youth kind of pushed our young lad with FASD to carry on with the game, which then actually resulted in serious injury to the victim. And our young lad has absolutely no understanding of what is going on there. He doesn't understand when does the game stop and it starts becoming a vicious attack on the victim. He doesn't have the ability to different, differentiate between the victim giving consent to play and now refusing to be part of that play. So it's easy to see how somebody like him, who has 
low intellectual abilities, wants to be accepted by a peer group, is probably already intoxicated, can lead to committing a serious crime without necessarily having an understanding of the consequences of his actions on the victim, on the bigger society in general, as well as for himself. So that, that's the kind of stuff that we have to deal with when we are looking at FASD specifically associated with conduct disorder. Obviously, with all these features, it leads to disruptions in education. As I've mentioned, trouble with the law. These people have difficulty getting employment. They do continue to use alcohol and substances. They generally lose contact with family. A large population of our youth are under the care of child welfare services. They are generally homeless. Most of them spend days on the street, sleeping in the malls, on couches in friends' houses, or actually strangers or drug dealers. So when they are dealing with these kind of people, what they are doing is they are selling drugs for them and as well as using drugs. Or they are confined in jail or treatment facilities and eventually some of these things might lead to premature death. So what are the specific issues that we need to be aware of when we are assessing these youth? A number of times they get referred to a service irrespective of the fact whether that's a tertiary mental health service, whether that's a community mental health service. They generally get referred in situations of crisis. So it's important to identify the reason for referral. More often than not, a referral is generated either by increased behavioral problems within the school or living environment. They might have been suspended from school, they might have been expelled from school, or they might have been involved with the criminal justice system. So it's important to determine the reason for that referral and even though they might be referred for an assessment it might sometimes be very important to deal with that crisis because if you don't deal with that crisis then it might be difficult to do rest of the assessment on some occasions as you may find that you have a resistant group of people the carers the teachers who probably want the crisis to be resolved first rather than dealing with other issues of assessment. If, however, there is no crisis or once the crisis has been dealt with, then the next important step should be to try and access whatever previous assessments have been carried out. If there are records that are available with child welfare services, which is very likely the case with most of these youth. If they have been assessed by mental health services in the past, it could be a psychiatrist, psychologist, neuropsychiatrist, neuropsychologist, sometimes a developmental pediatrician. They might have had psychoeducational assessments um, or other school-based assessments because of ongoing difficulties at school. They may have also been ha subjected to a family or parenting assessment if there have been concerns about neglect or abuse in the past. Try and identify important figures or carers within the, youth, within the youth's environment. They might be positive or negative influences, but it's important to identify them. Because despite whether they are a negative or a positive influence, they might be the only source of attachment for the youth. And unless we involve somebody like that in the assessment, we may not be able to complete an assessment. There have been occasions when we have struggled engaging a family in the assessment. There have been occasions when I have personally been threatened by some of the families where they were concerned 
that because of the fact that the youth had identified issues of neglect and abuse, there was a likelihood that the youth will be removed from their care. They might be resistant to be engaged in assessment because of their previous experiences with the system. They are usually suspicious, they can become hostile, or they may just refuse to engage at all. But still, identifying those figures is probably one of the most important things to do in this assessment. Because that is also a way of connecting with the youth. If you can show the youth that you care about who is important for them, it is more likely that you will be able to establish a good relationship with the youth during the process of assessment and when we are planning any future treatment or intervention issues, then that becomes an important thing to consider as well. Carrying on with assessment, they, the assessment itself, if there are no recent psychological or neuropsychological assessment, should cons consist of an updated latest psychological assessment, which might include an assessment of intellectual abilities. Uh, also, it will help to identify any deficits especially with specific functions like executive functioning or memory and learning. They should also be seen by a developmental pediatrician to rule out any genetic or family associated abnormalities. They might need to be seen by a neurologist if they have seizure disorder or any other specific central nervous system abnormalities a psychoeducational assessment to look at school-based academic deficits because these kids generally present with poor school performance, issues around truancy, suspensions, and expulsion. A psychiatrist should be involved to assess any ongoing mental health issues. A social worker should address issues around family environment. There might be issues related to values that promote violence, substance misuse. They generally come from broken families. They may have lack of support. And it's also important to look at sexual histories. As I've already mentioned, they are likely to have frequent sexual contacts, which may not necessarily be safe sexual contacts. In case of girls, they may have teenage pregnancies. Um, again, probably, just to emphasize uh, the importance of sexual history, um, about six months ago, we had a girl who, was, who had just turned 18 uh, from up north. I think she was from, gosh, Grand Prairie or maybe a bit further north. Was transferred to our facility from the Young Offender Center because they were concerned about her mental health. When we saw the girl, she was probably functioning at the level of a five year old, despite the fact that she was 18. And what we found out once we investigated her was that she was pregnant. This girl had no idea that she was pregnant, had no idea how long she had been into her pregnancy. What we also found out was that this was actually her second pregnancy. And her first child had been taken into care soon after birth. So she obviously she had no idea, so she was not involved with any prenatal services. She was continuing to use drugs and alcohol because she has no understanding of the effects of alcohol or drugs on the fetus. So we managed to hook her up with some prenatal services. But the problem is, you don't even know whether this girl is going to continue to be engaged with these services once she's out. So that's where it's important to have a good sexual history to find out what has been going on. And an occupational therapist should also be involved to look at their ability to execute activities of daily living. 
most of these youth have no concept of taking care of personal hygiene. Usually they need a lot of guidance, usually they need a lot of support. Very few of them are registered with a family physician. Most of them would not have seen a dentist during their lifetime. Quite a few of them actually present with a sexually transmitted disease. A lot of them have other physical health problems which they are not aware of. So a thorough neurological and general physical examination is also very important as part of the assessment. Now, looking at comorbidity, generally by the time uh, these youth reach the age of 14, 15, 16, they would have attracted a number of diagnoses. I have seen youth who have been diagnosed with ADHD, conduct disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, depression, attachment disorders, sleep disorders, speech and language disorders, pervasive developmental disorders, psychosis, substance misuse disorder, adjustment disorder, and anything else that you can think of under the category of child and developmental disorders in DSM. The commonest diagnoses probably are ADHD and conduct disorder, as well as substance misuse disorder. And if we look at the diagnosis of ADHD, obviously kids with ADHD present with impulsivity, hyperactivity, and inattention, which are also the features that are seen with FASD. So tr depending on the purpose of the assessment, one could try and assess specifically for ADHD, looking at rating scales like the Connors rating scale, interviewing the child as well as the carers, and looking at school reports. But then these are anyway the issues that are very likely to be present with, in a youth with FASD. Similarly, when we look at conduct disorder, we are looking at various behaviors that are categorized as antisocial behaviors, like aggression to people, aggression to animals. These youth engage in frequent bullying or threatening behaviors. They may start fights. They frequently use weapons. They show physical cruelty to people or animals. They engage in thefts and confrontations. They might engage in property destruction, which might again include setting fires to cause serious damage or property damage. The lying or theft might include breaking into buildings, cars, houses, lying, stealing. And generally, the serious rule violation in youth with conduct disorder begins before age 13. They frequently stay out at night against their parents' or carers' wishes. They would run away overnight from home, and they would be frequent truanting from school. Again, one can see how youth with FASD might get involved in some of these behaviors because they are more likely to be accepted by a peer group who is already involved in some of these behaviors. So if they are involved in substance misuse, if they are involved in lying, stealing, they are more likely to be accepted. One of the processes of being accepted by a gang is something called initiation. And a number of youth will tell us that as part of the initiation, they either had to go out and beat somebody up or commit a serious crime, or they were themselves beaten up by a group of members of the gang. So if that's the only thing they need to do to be accepted, it's much easier to rather try and communicate with somebody because they have significant communication and social difficulties. They might also present with major mental illnesses, like mood symptoms. Quite a few of them have mood symptoms or psychotic illness, which might either be secondary to substance misuse or 
might be related to their general environment and lifestyle. However, it's important to try and differentiate between mood disorder and anger outbursts. Very frequently, anger outbursts are confused with a mood disorder. So it's not very, or rather it's not uncommon for a carer or a youth worker or a child welfare worker to present with the youth saying they probably have a mood disorder when what they're actually having is frequent anger outbursts or temper tantrums, which might be related to the environment or their behavioral difficulties in general. The youth might present with hallucinations or delusions, which might be primary or secondary to substance misuse again. And it is important to observe them over a period of time while they have been free of all drugs and alcohol. They might also present with ideas to harm themselves or others, which may have different reasons. Some of these youth present with self-harm and say they do it just because they saw a peer doing it. Does it do anything for them? Probably nothing. Some of these youth might stop doing it after some time. Some of them carry on engaging in self-harm because it helps them to deal with their anger and frustration, while some of them have serious ideas to kill themselves. So it is important to do that assessment when you're seeing a youth like that. Which then brings me to my next slide, which is about risk assessment. And one of the important things of risk assessment is about risk, to harm, risk of harm to self. As I've already mentioned, lots of these youth present with low, low self-esteem isolation, lack of social support, substance misuse, mental health issues, as well as history of abuse, which is frequently physical, emotional, as well as sexual. One can either use standardized scales or do a clinical assessment. However, if there are even the slightest of concerns regarding risk, to harm, risk of harm to self, then a thorough assessment of that should be done as soon as possible while ensuring that their youth is in a safe environment. Any threats to harm self should be taken seriously and be dealt with. The next stage obviously would be assessing risk of harm to others. Um, in the last 15 years or so, there have been a number of risk assessment tools which have specifically focused on youth. However, the most commonly used tool for risk of harm to others is something called the Schedule for Assessment of Violence Risk in Youth, or SAVRI. The SAVRI is based on, um, or rather uses three categories for assessment of risk, uh, which are divided under historical, individual, and social categories. Um, the historical items are obviously static. Uh, they are things like past history of violence, history of violent offending, history of nonviolent offending, um, first age of onset of violent behaviors. While the individual and social factors are dynamic, or they change over time, or with changes in the status of the youth. So they are things uh, like compliance with intervention or treatment, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, presence of remorse or empathy. And this, this tool also has some protective factors. So the protective factors actually serve to reduce the risk, which could be like um, presence of attachment and bonding. So if there is a significant family member or a carer present, or the other factor is strong commitment to school, or a resilient personality, so their ability to cope with stressors. 
And again, these, these are factors that serve to reduce the risk of reoffending in future, while they also help to formulate a plan for intervention in future. The, the other commonly seen problem with these youth is sleep disorders. The sleep, they have, might have difficulty falling asleep, they might have frequent awakenings, or they might get up early in the morning. And though it might sound trivial, but the sleep dis difficulties could interfere with daily activities, could interfere with the behavior of the youth, could also affect their learning abilities, their cognition. So may, they may not engage well at school. It might affect their health and subsequently affect the management of the youth. The sleep difficulties or the disorders in themselves could be a result of the brain maldevelopment or health problems or it could be simply inadequate sleep hygiene. So if, if they are used to drugs and alcohol, obviously drugs and alcohol can affect their sleep. Or if they're living in an environment where it's very loud, noisy, too bright, or they are engaged in activities which might, be, which might stimulate them just before going to sleep, all those things can affect their sleep at night. It could also be affected by emotional and social issues. So if they are living in a family where they are repeatedly subjected to abuse or they don't have a place to live, if they are homeless, or if there are ongoing mental health issues within the family where they have a carer who is not present to support them, to supervise them, so all those things are quite important when we are looking at the assessment of some of the behavioral difficulties that are seen in these youth with conduct disorder. Then they may also present with speech disorders. They may have receptive or expressive language delays. So it's important to engage a speech and language pathologist. Some of these disorders may again be a result of brain maldevelopment or they could be a result of poor development of facial mus muscles. They may be a result of developmental delays. And generally, the speech difficulties do worsen when they are subjected to stress or anxiety, which could further result in low self-esteem and isolation or depression or rejection from peer group. And finally, I'd like to leave you with this little poem that was, uh, I, I found it on the internet. It's by Bruce Ritchie, which talks about a child who has possibly a diagnosis of FASD. Um, I'm, I'm probably not going to go through it, but it's, it's quite telling that we expect that these children are able to deal with a number of issues when they don't have the ability to deal with them. So they have been subjected to abuse, trauma, permanent brain injury, lack of support, lack of care, lack of appropriate role models, but our expectations are really high of them. Thank you.